Hello again everybody and welcome back yet again to the rectory dining room uh, which has become a church from church so to speak um, and a church is a spiritual home this is both our home and our spiritual home which is makes it particularly appropriate I think that we are using the dining room. Anyway um, as the saying goes I have a packed program for you um, no <laughs> take it more seriously of course Thank you to everybody, as always, who makes this possible. And in particular, um, we have Mark and Kevin, who are offering today's readings, and Deb, who is going to lead our intercessions, and Susan, who is um, going to be preaching for us and reading the Gospel, of course. Uh, so we'll hand over to them in due time. And again, many thanks, Crystal, for the music. Becky for all the editorial work and thank you to all of you who share this time. It seems strange, um, it's what the Church of England seems to call spiritual communion at the moment, but I think if nothing else the symbolic act of me receiving the bread and wine uh, is somehow um, a part of our corporate worship as well as we all come together in the presence of the living God through his son Jesus by his spirit. As always, um, everything is uh, as you would expect. If there are responses, I'll give you a little bit of time just either to reflect or repeat. Um, one or two different prayers, and I found a really nice um, blessing, which I'll deal with after communion. And uh, I hope that uh, as part of this act of worship, you will feel that you are worshipping God as well and sharing in that with all of us, not just Heather and me in the rectory, but everyone who's at home. And so take a moment to be quiet, just to offer this time to God. And whatever the realities of the past week or the coming week might be, simply leave those with God for these few minutes as together we worship him and know that we are one in him. The Lord be with you and also with you. And a prayer to begin our worship. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Perhaps I found this confession, uh, which reminds us uh, of the way the world is at the moment. Perhaps reminds us of some of the images we see in the media, the reports that we hear. I'll leave a little bit of a quiet after each bidding before uh, the response, just so that you can uh, reflect on those words too. Lord Jesus, you wept over the sins of your city. On our city, on our land, on our world. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division, jealousy and bitterness. On us, Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bring pardon and peace to the sinner. Grant us peace. Lord have mercy. And Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And this week's collect. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is small as mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and to the flourishing of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now uh, we go over to uh, Mark and then Kevin for our readings. And if you uh, feel you can, just take a moment perhaps after them to reflect quietly um, on what you've heard on the words before we move on to the Gospel. The first book of Kings. Chapter 3, verses 5 to 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you, and righteous, and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this, so God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in a misery and justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from St Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any change against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemn, condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall we trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us 
from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'll hand over to Susan who will read the Gospel and preach for us. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 33 and 44 to 52. Another story. God's kingdom is like a pine nut that a farmer plants. It is quite small as seeds go, but in the course of years it grows into a huge pine tree and eagles build nests in it. Another story. God's kingdom is like yeast that a woman works into the dough of her dozens of loaves of barley bread and waits while the dough rises. God's kingdom is like treasure hidden in a field for years and then accidentally found by a trespasser. The finder is ecstatic, what a find, and proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise money and buy that field. While God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for excellent pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. While God's kingdom is like a fish net cast into the sea, catching all kinds of fish. When it is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked up and put in a tub. Those unfit to eat are thrown away. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and cull the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. Jesus asked, are you starting to get a handle on all this? They answered yes. He said, then you see how every student well trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put their hands on anything they need, old or new, exactly when they need it. Amen. Open our ears to your words, Lord, and not mine. Open our minds to your presence and our hearts to your love. Amen. All being well with the technology, either Mark or Kevin should have read from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to the end. Do you ever find that when you're struggling with something, something will happen that makes you realise that God was listening and in his own unique and subtle way he sends you a message? Last week I was really struggling. As apart from work colleagues, I've had very little face-to-face -face contact with friends or family. I've zoomed them, which is great, but it's not the same, is it? But I found last week I was really missing everyone. It's been four months since I've seen my mum and dad, my brothers, sisters and nieces. Then I started to prepare this sermon and read the readings for Sunday. And there was my answer. In the book of Romans, written nearly 2,000 years ago and speaking to my heart today. Nothing can separate us from the love of God and nothing can separate us from love. There might be 70 miles between me and my family, my dad's shielding because of his health, but we have love, so even in the midst of a pandemic, nothing can separate us. And the same goes for all my family and friends. Nothing can truly come between us. Time, distance, a virus, a computer screen. We have love and faith to bind us together. I found the reading a real comfort as I was missing everyone. Even the way it starts, I was feeling weak and helpless, but it states that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't always know what we should pray for, but the Spirit does. It searches our hearts and minds and intercedes to God. There I was floundering in a low moment, and I read that God already knows what's in my, going on in my heart and in my head. And later in the reading, it says that nothing, nothing at all, death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, any powers, height, depth, nothing at all in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there was my subtle and unique message delivered in God's own special way. And it lifted my spirits enormously. And that, I think, leads us very nicely into the gospel reading that I started with. Five parables in one short reading. A power, parable sorry, is a story with an obvious me meaning and maybe several other meaning, 
explanations or interpretations for those that wish to look deeper, helping to provide a better understanding. Jesus used them to talk to the people and his disciples passed them on and we're still passing them on now and looking for their meanings and their relevancy in today's world. I took the reading from the Message Bible today. We usually know the first parable with a mustard seed. Mustard seed, pine seed, any little seed, a tiny little thing that grows and grows to become something entirely different. A tree sustaining lives of birds, insects, shelter for some, a home providing oxygen, even its fallen leaves or needles providing sustenance and homes for other creatures. That's the obvious explanation, but what else could it mean? It could be the growth of the kingdom of God, starting small, growing and spreading to encompass all, providing for life and shelter and home for us all, a spiritual kingdom on earth for us. It could be the growth of the kingdom of heaven, our spiritual home in the next life. Either way, the kingdom, God or heavens is ours in this life and in the next. What do we do to enter into the kingdom? We have to accept God as king and become obedient to his will for us in this life and the next. We aren't expected to build the kingdom or to establish it, but we can certainly help to grow it by following our calling, doing what we can, where we can to help others, to be the hands of Jesus on earth. Don't wait for a miracle to happen. Be the miracle. Make good things happen. Follow the example of Jesus. Spread his love, his joy, his mission on earth. The second parable of the yeast and bread also helps to understand the kingdom. A tiny bit of yeast will totally transform flour and water from okay to wow. Nothing wrong with flour and water bread, but add the yeast and you have something that goes much further, feeds more people, satisfies for longer. God could be the yeast. Add him to your life and you go from okay to wow. On another level, the yeast grows the kingdom for us to enjoy and we accept God as king. Or maybe we are the yeast to help to grow and transform the kingdom. What's the value of God's kingdom on earth or in heaven? The other parables help to explain that. The trespasser accidentally stumbles on hidden treasure in a field. He knows he can't walk away with it. It would be theft. Instead, he sells everything he owns to buy the field and then the hidden treasure becomes his. Thankfully for us, the kingdom isn't hidden, but it is a far greater value than living our life without acknowledging God as king. This parable could be saying that we should cast off our old ways and accept the kingdom of God. Or the jewel merchant who finds the perfect pearl and sells everything to be able to buy it. He sells his house, his clothes, his possessions to be able to own such a precious thing. Jesus is suggesting that the kingdom of God is worth selling everything these people own. It's so precious and valuable. It's worth giving up or sacrificing everything for. What else do we know about the kingdom? In other passages in the gospel, Jesus says the kingdom is amongst us. Evidence, I think, that accepting God as king means that his kingdom is here on earth now and we are living in it. Elsewhere in the gospel, it tells us that the blessings of the kingdom are forgiveness, salvation and eternal life. We pray for his kingdom to come every time we say the Lord's Prayer. What would you give up or sacrifice to enter the kingdom of God? Would you give up all your worldly goods or follow your calling to spread the kingdom on earth? The reading in Romans says that nothing gets between us and God, so he will let us into the kingdom as long as we let him into our lives. And what happens if we don't choose to accept God and his kingdom? The last parable explains that part. The parable says the fishing net will be full and the good fish sorted from the bad, the bad fish thrown in the garbage. He says there'll be no point complaining, and no point weeping, gnashing your teeth, it's too late. He says we need to be good fish. No, of course not, we're not fish are we? But it means we need to live a good life and try our best while we are here. 
because on Judgment Day, we won't be able to say, well, I tried, I tried to be good, and it wasn't my fault, uh, weather was bad, I didn't have the right tools, I wasn't prepared, the train was late, no excuses. We must do what we can, where we can, and work towards our callings. The very last verse of the reading tells us we have everything at hand. It's within our reach in the kingdom of God. So we have no excuse to not follow our callings. If we choose to enter God's kingdom, then like the owner of a general store, we can put our hands on anything we need, old or new, whenever we need it. We have everything we need in the kingdom of God, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're accepted and forgiven just as we are. Maybe these parables have other me deeper meanings to you. What do they say to you in today's modern world? What's your interpretation of God's kingdom? How can you help to grow it? What would you sacrifice to get into the kingdom? I'll leave you to ponder these questions. Amen. And thank you. And here is a, a short affirmation of faith. Um, just for reasons of time, we haven't always included a creed, but uh, this is a lovely one written a few years ago, based on Paul's uh, words to the church and Christians at and around Ephesus. We declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And as I hand over now to Deb for our intercessions, don't forget that your intercessions are part of the words she will use, that your, you have on your heart and mind to bring to God is incorporated in the words that she speaks. And so together we bring all of our prayers to God. Lord, be with us as we join together in prayer wherever we are. Father, we give you grateful thanks for the love you pour on each of us and the joys and blessings that we receive each day. We ask you to bless our church as we make preparations and adjustments to worship together physically again. We thank you for the ministry that has been possible during this strange period of lockdown through our modern communications and we pray for all the people these services have reached, especially those who have come new to our worship. We ask you to continue to bless us all as we go forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask your guidance for all who are making policy for the future of this country, both in terms of health provision and in discussions about our national role. Give them wisdom in their proposals and help them to bear in mind all who are most vulnerable, that the weakest in our society will be cared for adequately. Help those who disagree to make their views known without violence and for all to work for the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world. We remember those areas where war continues and pray for peace to come. We remember all the displaced people who crave a settled life. We pray for the day to come that clean water, sufficient food, medication and education will become available to everyone. And we long for that time. Fill us with a spirit of generosity to play our part. Support and uphold all those who are working to this end, whether in administration 
all on the front line facing these difficulties head on. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the coronavirus continues to rampage through the world, we pray for the areas which are least able to cope with it, such as Latin America and India. We pray for the medical staff who are working long hours with few facilities and little medication or equipment. We ask for your comfort and grace for the dying and their families. Lord, support those working hard to find vaccinations and the people who are volunteering to test them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people affected by the ripples of the pandemic with loss of jobs and income, for people who are suffering with the stresses of unemployment, difficult relationships or mental ill health. Lord, we pray for the organisations to which these suffering can turn for help and ask you to uplift those who give their time and effort to this work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holding in our hearts those in our parish who continue to endure health problems and the recently bereaved, we pray for them and for those known to us personally who are in need of your love today. Help them to know the comfort of your Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to be kind to those around us this coming week and to be safe in the knowledge of your everlasting love for us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. During this uh, time of lockdown and easing, one of the things that struck me most has been how important our daily living is. We have no opportunity to kind of be in worship and and simply think that an hour on Sunday is enough. Our Christian faith is seen exclusively in our daily living with one another. And so today's peace is particularly appropriate for these times. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. If we live by the Spirit, let us then walk by the Spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We share that peace with one another. Uh, please share it with whoever is in your household or bubble today. Uh, but share it anyway with those of us who are not in your presence, that we may all together on our journey of faith and our walk with Christ know his peace. And so we bring these gifts to God's table. We say, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power 
and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. When him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Peter, Francis and all your saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ, with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we pray with confidence as Jesus himself taught all of those who follow his ways and whom he calls friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are one body, many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, give us peace. So all you who hunger and thirst for a better life, for a deeper faith, for a better world. Here is the bread of life. We feed on it with gratitude. Here is the cup of salvation. We drink from it and believe.
share together in the prayer after communion. Lord God, you feed us with the living bread from heaven. Renew our faith, increase our hope and strengthen our love. Teach us to hunger for Christ, who is the true and living bread, and to live by every word that comes from your mouth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm just going to say a short prayer. Not called God is generous. To those without food, God is generous. To those without work, God is generous. To those away from home and to those still stuck in their home shielding, God is generous. To those who ask for help, God is generous. Today, here where we live, God is generous. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you, and with all those whom you love, pray for and live among day by day. This week, in the days and weeks to come, and then for evermore. Amen. And so please can I ask you to keep an eye on that website. We are now starting to prepare the church for a start. The PCC has passed a resolution which says that we will start our worship together again no later than the 6th of September. That is the dispensation the bishop has given us. Um, there may be one or two other things before then. Um, keep your eye on the website and if you know somebody who doesn't do the internet or Facebook uh, who would like to know please tell them and remind them and keep them up to speed. I think that's a kind of Christian act of kindness to make sure that those who otherwise might not know what's going on are kept up to speed. And I'm assuming since you're watching me and hearing this that you are all at that point anyway. Um, August is a quieter time. Schools are now finished until September. We are expecting more changes as time goes on and as those changes affect the way we operate we will obviously let you know. But good news is Church is also now open on a Friday and open roughly from 10 till 4 each day. God bless you all. I look forward to seeing you, whether in church, in the supermarket or wherever else we encounter one another. Um, take care, stay safe and well. Morning all, I hope you're well and enjoying some dry sunny weather. Uh, this morning we have got the Church's One Foundation, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer, Broken For Me, Broken For You and Longing For Light.
that's it from me today wishing you all a safe happy and healthy week the next few weeks i'm actually in cornwall on a well well needed family holiday which i cannot wait for um so i will be thinking of you all but i must confess it's all been pre-recorded and sent off so you will still hear me i will be with you in spirit but not in person lots of love take care and i will speak to you when i get back bye